I should travel more for uh, my things that I want to get back because I could just come out and set up in the garage and just be in the gym. I don't want to say that. I'm going to do this. So I came on the day with this. And Mary Ellen's still up there. She's supposed to call tomorrow. Um, yeah, and then she'll go back up Sunday because she, she can't pretend she had to drive. Yeah. Good. All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank you all that are online and watching this. And we're going to record this so we can play it on our website and folks can refer back to this at a later date. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of set, set the stage and a little bit of background before Anthony Roper comes up. Anthony's the lead consultant for uh, CEPI Engineering on this project. And our, our goal uh, tonight is to try and um, explain to folks where we've, what we've traditionally done when it comes to the pavement um, maintenance, street maintenance, and explain the transition uh, into this pavement preservation, and then kind of explain what the, um, the next, maybe up to 10 years could look like as far as capital improvement planning. Um, so, Back earlier uh, in or late last year, um, we got a report from CEPI Engineering, a payment condition survey and capital improvement plan. We went out, uh, sent out RFQs for this project. We got about 11, went through a process and uh, selected CEPI so they could do an, uh, go and do an assessment of our pavement and its condition. Prior to that, it was uh, 2004 was the last time we had ever done a survey uh, of our street system or street network. And, and let me say the, re the reason I think we're putting maybe a little bit more emphasis in this is we all recognize that our, our pavement, our streets are one of our biggest assets. We have 37 miles of streets um, and it's one of the, you know, the, our main assets and we need to take care of it. The council before and this council um, has made sure to prioritize that. Um, for the last several years, um, we still have a capital improvement committee um, that would meet, they were appointed, each council member would appoint a member to the uh, capital improvement committee, it was made up of uh, town manager, town engineer, public works director, um, and that committee would put together a list, and I'll highlight, I'll blow this up, um, of, of streets and they would they would list them from group A, B and C. And a lot of these streets, this, these streets have been um, constructed and you'll see as it goes down the list, engineering uh, reports, but a lot of these were full depth rebuilds. And for example, we would take a section, we did this most recently um, on Sea Oats Trail, we would, uh, effectively rebuild the street from, from the bottom up. Um, and in doing that, we had calculated that we know uh, that, whoops, if we continued on that path, forgive me, it was about five cents of our tax rate was appropriated yearly to street maintenance. And at that time, this was back before Reval, we were $162,000 a year. Now that figures more at five cents with Reval, it's up closer to about $820,000. But at the time this was done in 2020, it would take uh, 25, almost $26 million and 39 years for us to finish a complete balance of um, road work. And so the, one of the main goals and purposes of this uh, pavement study was to be able to touch more streets with that same amount of money. And I wanted to show this, this will give you an idea of what we've done since fiscal year 2017, looking back um, right in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, 703,000, 400,000, 800,000, 287, and then most recently 582 last year. And you'll see these list of projects of the streets that were done uh, during those fiscal years. Um, one thing, and Anthony will get into this, I, I, I want to, to kind of establish from the get-go. You'll, you'll see from this chart when the study was done that this lists our streets from excellent, good, fair, poor, and failed. We've got 
uh, uh, street sections are um, divided up, but you'll see we have of our streets, total streets, 26.81 miles or 73% of our streets are in the fair condition. Our goal from this is to get as many of those as quickly as we can up to the good or fair, uh, or excuse me, good or excellent. Uh, and Anthony can explain you know, the, more about that. If you look at this graph, this will show kind of in the years, we start in um, 2022, you'll see the, the yellow uh, represents streets that are fair, the orange represents streets that are good, and the green represents streets that are excellent. Our goal is to try and get the green, move the green up that graph, that bar, uh, as far as we, as much as we can. So over the life of this project, you'll see we've increased some um, streets to, uh, the streets to excellent. We've got a majority in good condition and uh, considerably less streets in the fair condition. And so as, as part of the CIP that gets produced from this, what folks will be able to see in better view than this now, um, you'll see the, the graph on the, or the map on the left shows our street network. And this depicts the year 2022. And it'll show you that, it'll, it'll show the streets based on the, the, the pavement condition index, the score of these streets the green streets highlighted will show you, those are the ones that are gonna be uh, patched. And then the, there's a construction project you'll see uh, kind of in the maroon. Um, and we'll have this laid out for each year so folks can go and see when their street uh, is scheduled for work and what work is scheduled. Uh, and I think the last slide I wanna show is, this, this will give you the budget of Next project, this is kind of a estimated budget or draft really at this point um, of the pavement preservation. The SEPI put together two options to begin with. One was about a million, one was about 650,000. And the council wanted to kind of get in the middle of those two. And so what we're looking at is a third option of spending about $800,000 a year um, to, to preserve and, and to improve our street pavement system. So that's the top number, the pavement preservation. Um, council also recognized that along the way, we're still gonna have to address some construction issues uh, as well as some stormwater issues. So what, what's been kind of discussed at this point is budgeting about a million dollars a year in street improvements about 800,000 of that will go towards the pavement condition improvement and about 200,000 to construction. And then every year, if, if whatever's remaining, will go into a capital reserve fund and that'll start to build from there. So I'm gonna stop there and let Anthony come up and kind of give you the nuts and bolts of how this works. Uh, thanks, Cliff, and, and good afternoon, everyone, and uh, those that are in the room and those that are online. My name is Anthony Roper. I'm Vice President, Asset Management and Maintenance Director uh, at CEPI Engineering. And uh, prior to that, I spent about 28 years at the Department of Transportation and in Division One. He did, and so very familiar with uh, Southern Shores. And and so I was, uh, I was telling one of the gentlemen from living Columbia now. So this is home to me. It's, uh, even though my company's in Raleigh, I'm home. So I'm glad to be here and and thankful for the opportunity to work with the town and and Cliff and his team has been uh, really good to work with. And so I want to get into Cliff has pretty much made the presentation, and I'm just going sing and dance for the next 25 minutes and uh, and then sit down and respond to questions. So uh, so what we were tasked with doing after the uh, pavement condition survey and the capital improvement plan was to develop a implementation plan for year one uh, of, the, uh, of the capital plan. So what I want to do tonight is briefly discuss just to kind of further set some context that Cliff was doing, the uh, pavement condition survey results I want to give an overview of what the council approved in the strategy. And again, Cliff spoke to some of that. I just want to dig a little bit deeper into that. And then kind of uh, 
show you the year one plan, what we're doing, uh, drill into that, and then respond to any questions uh, that uh, everyone, anyone may have. So looking at the, uh, the Peyton Gerson survey, uh, we collected the data in March of last year. Uh, we did QA, QC, the data do for accuracy and consistency in April of last year. I'll say that the data, the distresses that we identified to develop the plan was in accordance with uh, federal standards. Uh, it's called the Long-Term Pavement Performance Project. It's a federal highway standard that uh, a majority, of, a significant number of, of public agencies have adopted across the country. So whether you're here or whether you're in Raleigh or Charlotte or Elizabethtown, or you, you pick the town that have, that have doing paper condition surveys, all the ones that we've done, uh, practically all of them, we've used this methodology uh, for consistency sake. Um, and just a few stats, as, about, as Cliff mentioned, is 36.7 miles of paved streets, which correlated to 162 street segments. And when we say street segments, we try to determine logical termini uh, to end the segment. So, and we try to either at intersections or typically, uh, sometimes we look at what would be a reasonable paving uh, uh, segment, but you try to put some logic into to that. And all this was done in a GIS uh, format such that it can be certainly easily duplicated or replicated in the future. And there's some mapping, some of the other graphical things that you'll see, uh, we use GIS to do that. Uh, Cliff, again, did a, a good job of talking about this particular slide as to some of the results. The overall uh, PCI for the town was 71. So you see it's right in barely overall into the good category, uh, slightly above the fair. It's a, weight, it's a weighted average. And when we, I want to be clear, when we say excellent, good, fair, poor, fail, it's a measurement of the discrescence. You know, sometimes when people see PCI results, they think we're ranking the roads and putting them one to what's worse and what's first, but that's not necessarily the case. This is the measurement of the distresses uh, for that road is what we're, we're doing here. And as Ken Cliff highlighted, 73% uh, of your network is in the fair uh, category. And I think that's significant. Uh, I think because uh, what you see, what you will we'll talk about later is that the more uh, distressed the road is, the poor and fail, there's significantly more cost uh, to make those repairs. And so you've got 73% in the fair category, and as they deteriorate, then the cost to maintain those roads, it goes up pretty substantially as you go forward. So I think that's kind of the driver behind, I think the strategy that we recommended uh, to the, the town is that you really need to address and look at how quickly can we move that needle on that 73% in the fair and move those to the good and the excellent. Once you get there, then the cost of treatments are significantly uh, uh, different, uh, lower, and you can touch more miles. Um, again, Cliff talked about uh, what you're doing previously, and I'll talk about that again later, but I think the reality is you are touching an area of uh, somewhere around a half a mile or less a year uh, compared to what we're going to show you we can do through a, a, different, a different strategy and approach. So, so why does it matter? I wanted to throw this in, why does it matter? Uh, Cliff talked about the, if you implement the plan, he showed a graphic that showed what happens with the plan if you, if you implement it. And if you notice on the, what Cliff had, had up earlier, if you look to the far right uh, on the one that Cliff had showed, you didn't see any red. So that's failed. So what we're, say, what we're projecting uh, through modeling is that in 10 years, if you do nothing, then you're going to see those fares are going to change into pores and fails just through the natural deterioration of asphalt. So I think that's the significance and the, the impetus for looking at uh, can we amend our strategy to improve our overall health of our network. And we, and we can come back to that later. But I want to kind of set the context. This is why, it's kind of the why. You know, the plan is the how. But the why we want to do that, I think, is best reflected in this graphic right here. 
So we again, we came and as Cliff indicated, we came and presented. I think it was in August uh, 2021, a couple of options to the council, and you know we had some, so a very good discussion there, a very engaged discussion, and they came back and asked that we, we presented two scenarios. One was a six hundred seventy-five thousand um, dollar option, or and a million dollar option, and then uh, through the council's uh, deliberations, they came back and asked us to put together an eight hundred thousand dollar option, and this is what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. So the is again as Cliff indicated the is the the plan is funded at approximately eight hundred thousand dollars a year for what I'm calling maintenance, and I want to be clear about that. You know, uh, uh, Cliff talked about uh, full depth rebuilds. In my parlance, that is construction. It's not it's construction. It's not maintenance. And so what you were doing when you go and rebuild the road from the bottom up, and you, you know, improve the the footprint and you d improve ditches and all those things, that's a construction project. What we're talking about here is a maintenance project dealing with the pavement. And, you know, certainly, and so in the council in their wisdom, and I think it was a wise decision, uh, in addition to the $800,000 maintenance, also had the $200,000 for construction or major improvements. And so, because there may be situations where roads warrant some construction activity. And so I think the council uh, wisely decided that they would at least create a funding source mechanism to deal with those construction uh, options uh, as, as they're as required. And, and and we can, again, at the question session, we can talk about different scenarios where that may be applicable, uh, but it shouldn't be applicable on every road, I think was kind of the thing that we saw when we looked at it. So the approach uh, strategy was to allocate funds and plan maintenance activities that focus on keeping the good roads good and improving those fair roads. And so it's by do, we do this through a proactive implementation of a payment management system with a mix of re rehabilitation and preventative maintenance activities. And we call it preservation and preventative maintenance strategies for good roads. And that would include some traditional maintenance um, uh, techniques, crack seals, surface patches, and seals. And I think that I want to point out, this is nothing new. Uh, uh, these are all maintenance treatments that are uh, uh, used uh, universally in the industry, in municipalities and state governments and private uh, developments. And so it's not new things that we're, we're proposing here. The other thing I want to say about these is that when you put together a, a plan and you, and you have a strategy, we understand that every road has a life cycle. And I think that's a policy decision, how fat, rapidly do you want to re overlay every road. So it, we're not saying when we, if we adopt this plan, if the council moves forward with this plan, and we are, is that that's the road will never get resurfaced. But what we're saying is these treatments uh, help maintain the road, preserve the road, keep them from fair, further deterioration until their time comes up in the schedule for uh, repaving. And I think that's a key point that I know sometimes when we think about maintenance and maintenance activities, I think the notion is that we're going to patch or we're going to crack seal and we're never going to touch the road again. That's not the point, the, the, the point of this plan. The point of this plan is we want to take those fares and see if through some maintenance activities we can bump it back to the good level, hold it until it's time comes up in the plan, and then we do an overlay of that. And I think really, we, I really want everyone to, to capture that, that point, the essence of that, uh, that these are uh, preventative, preservative measures, but, they also, but, and they're, but they're not intended to be uh, the end all and be alls uh, there. So anybody have a question about that? Yes. Um. <clears throat> Typically, you're talking about replacing pavement mm -hmm. and keeping the pavement level at a high quality. Mm -hmm. The problem that I see mm -hmm. is that in a lot of cases, it has nothing to do with the pavement. It has to do with a failure of the underlay. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you basically have a structure that has to be rebuilt in order to even begin mm -hmm. to get it to the pavement part. So, 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 and I can speak to that some. Uh, I think again. So, when we talk about patching, what what affects? So, uh, we all in Eastern North Carolina. I, I think we, we we're here, and we, I think there's poor soils as a general rule in this this part of the, the state. Poor soils, and so 
So poor soils in and of themselves, and we have roads on those poor soils and roads that are, are in, in, in good. So I guess, so water intrusion is, a, is the biggest threat. If you don't have consistent heavy loading, then water intrusion becomes the biggest detriment to, to your roads. Yes, sir. You're suggesting that the failure of the underlay mm -hmm. is really more a function of the soil problem or is it a function of decay which has permitted that subsurface to sink which affects the pavement on top? You do have some situations where there is, I guess, decay because of trees and other things. But they, 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 that material itself decays. I, I, I will warrant you that. So basically, even though the pavement is good, we're doing this. That would be a pavement issue, or would that be a construction issue? I think it's a case by case, and I think I, I think this is really what we're saying is that let's don't build a strategy on on the worst case scenario, unless it, then when we, those individual roads come up that have those issues that you're talking about. I think that's where the construction budget comes into play. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, so it's a great question, though, and I appreciate that. Uh, and so, and so, but again, though, in those situations where you don't have decay, where you don't have those, un, I guess, the underlying, and, I, and again, I, before I live in the area I've worked in, I, the roads were built a lot of times from they dug out canals and put the stuff in the sub base, and as, as that's the tree roots and stumps and all those things rot away, you get the undulations and those things. So I'm, I'm very familiar with, with what your what, what your concern. And so, and there, I'm not saying there isn't some roads like that, but uh, all of them, I don't think we found that all of them were in that type of situation. So when that's not the case, then the other issue becomes the road could fail from the top down because you get water intrusion. So crack sealing, patching, those things are designed to keep the water from getting the less than ideal soils from getting wet, getting from those clays to get wet and get, get spongy, so that's why you need to seal and patch because it prevents that from happening, absolutely. So so that's why uh, I guess we advocate for those kind of patching and maintenance activities. And then the, re the rehabilitation strategy for the poor and the fair roads would, would be uh, some substantial patching, digging out. If you have some bad soil areas, dig those out, backfill those, patch those, and then overlay those with a plant mix or, or, or thin lift. And so, again, trying to put rehab and rehabilitate the structure. Uh, again, and, and again, there's certainly always going to be certain anomalies in roads. Uh, you got tree roots that intrude and cause some buckling and other things. So, uh, certainly, we're not uh, uh, saying we're ignoring those things that impact the, the road, and they have to be dealt with. And and we think this addresses those with through uh, uh, patch some substantial patching and then overlay and then also and then obviously what we'd also recommend is that periodically that there be some further reevaluation to make sure that the plan that we're implementing is functioning as we uh, it intends and then we can make uh, adjustments as we go along and, and so uh, based on the evaluation of the ratings, uh, this slide here just to, just to correlate cost with repairs. And so you see well, excellent roads, obviously you do nothing there. Good roads, we say those are the roads that are, that are ideal for preservation. So as we get more roads into the good and excellent category, we can keep them there through preservation. The thin lift is again is much cheaper. You get to the minor rehab, that's where you get your patching, some mill and fill, which is basically a traditional mill off the asphalt that's deteriorated and put back good asphalt. Uh, and then in some cases, you may not have enough pavement structure, so you build up uh, with additional asphalt. Instead, of you, you mill out the bad asphalt, you replace that with a couple inches, and then in some cases, you put even an additional couple inches on top of that. Um, and then the, the poor roads, uh, we have that, again, some of the issues that you described, uh, those that you have to do some major repairs and you may have to go down into that separate and, and address that. To the right, you see, I guess, costs, you know, thin lift is at $15 a square yard. The minor overlays at $22 a square yard. Rehab is 28. So you see the cost starts going up 
as you start going down, I guess, in severity of, 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 the, of, of the, the, the lower the rating is, the more costly the repair is. So the more, the sooner we can engage roads to keep them from getting to poor fail, uh, it allows you to impact more roads. And so just here, just graphically wanted to show uh, uh, the cost of treatments, you know, in this first year, uh, you see the orange is patching, the blue is a major rehab with buildup. Uh, those are just the dollar distribution as we go year over year. So in, in this first year, it's close to uh, 700, uh, uh, almost $700,000 of uh, patching work, and then uh, a little over $100,000 of, of a major rehab on a particular road. I, I think this next slide, this is probably the crux of, uh, I think the essence of, in really another important slide message. If you look, as I said, and I think Cliff can confirm this, that on the slide where he showed it take 39 years. One of the reasons it took 39 or 40, almost 40 years was because you're only touching so little miles per year. And so you're doing uh, half a mile or so a year uh, that you were doing. Under this approach, uh, in year one, because of the significant patching in year one, and then you can touch almost seven miles in year one. And then if you look at that going across uh, over the 10 year life of this program, uh, you're going somewhere in the average of three to four miles a year that you're going to touch uh, with treatments. Now, obviously, after year one, you start seeing more of a blend of, of treatments. You see more rehabs, you see less patching. The patching pops back up in additional years. And again, we can get into the weeds of that understanding that where the why patching comes back in some, some of the later years. But again, the goal of the plan is to don't allow roads to go from fair to poor to fail. And roads deteriorate over time uh, on, but because of the normal aging process. And so, and in 2023, or I guess it'll be 2024, it'll be four, three years from when the evaluation was done. So those roads that were in the fair category deteriorated even more in the next three years if you do nothing. So instead of letting them continue to deteriorate, we go in and patch those roads in those years to bring the overall back up to the good level. And then we move forward again with more uh, overlays and rehabs going forward. And that's a function of, again, uh, you, know, you can put more money in and never do any more patching after year one. But again, given the funding plan that, you, that, that we chose, um, uh, that was a way to keep those good roads out there. And I think you'll see a good end result. I'm going to show you the end result at the end of 10 years. I think with this mix of fix, what we call a mix of fix strategy, uh, we think we were successful in accomplishing the goal uh, going in. I apologize, I didn't get, couldn't get some cleaner pictures, but on the left-hand side was a, is a, you see the dotted line, that's a marked area that on South Dalton. And we'll cut that out and it'll be straight and tidy. And so I, I found that I had one of my team send me a picture of an edge patch uh, that, that would be, it's not from, it's an edge patch. And really what we're trying to display there is that it'd be cut It'll be dug out, uh, any the bad asphalt, if there's any bad material, it'll be dug out and then it'll be patched back. Yes, sir. How do you address migration? Say again? How do you address migration at the edge of that road? Part of the issue is not failure in this, it was flooding the neighborhood So how do you address that? Well, can you repeat the question? Okay. His question was, how do you address the migration? I, I think he means by that is if the shoulder is, wa shoulder is, is washing away or, or shoving, out, shoving out, then the pavement, when, it's, when traffic drives on it, it has a tendency to push that edge, edge out. And, and so uh, I think there's a couple of things. And the, the easy one thing is, obviously, I think it does put some burden on your maintenance team to maintain those shoulders in terms of regularly trying to pull those shoulders back up and trying to seed those and stabilize those shoulders uh, so they won't, when they get wet and all, they won't move. I think the other part of the equation is, you know, and we saw a lot of these edge cracks and a lot of the places where we saw them was where there was house construction and other things going on. I mean, some of the ones, that's what my team told me, they saw some they saw 
some construction saw some truck loading on those edges. So um, if where there is construction, there's some maybe some policy things that it, the town can consider in terms of on the maintenance side and in the contract side, you could instead of where there's sand, I think you know, they, the DOT uses a lot of more aggregate material on the shoulder because it is, one is it's easier to put in place. They can trench out and put that in and it tends to the water the vehicles try and pass each other and therefore putting considerable weight on the outer edges of these roads that that can be a factor but uh, i think that's those are again policy considerations the town has to consider about minimum width of pavements and those things that so that wasn't it was not a part of the scope of what we were asked to look at no sir so that would the edge patch you see there again the intent would be to saw cut so it'd be a straight cut uh, obviously we would make sure to be a straighter cut to so be a neater looking patch than what you see here but uh, just for illustrative purposes i wanted to share, share that picture another type would be uh here i guess it'd be with some meal patching yes okay uh, in this particular case we would mechanically come and mill out this marked out area there. And, and and to your point, when you mechanically do it, you do get straighter edges and it, it is it get better you get better control over depth and, and direction and those things. And so and you'll when we get to the map of what we're actually going to do, you'll see several locations where the mill patchings we think is easier to do than to saw and, and do those things. On, on the edge crack, because of the width of it, the, the width of the miller, you almost mill out more than what you needed to. So that's why some of those are dressed differently. And and, you know, and we can look at that. You know, obviously, as we talk to Cliff and the team, uh, we and certainly I'm not insensitive to the aesthetics or value is important in uh, anywhere, but particularly in a community uh, uh, like this. So I certainly appreciate that. And so if we, if meal patches, what we need to do, we do wider patches. And obviously there's a cost involved in that, but there's certain discussions and conversations we can have. And then, you know, another, just example, another example of a place on itself, trying, again, trying to uh, preserve the pavement and don't allow that to further deteriorate. So the, the plan itself, and again, Cliff had showed you that, and so this basically is kind of list out this, this, the streets that will be included in uh, year one of the plan. Um, and this was again, mostly trying to address roads that were in the fair category, trying to move them up to good. And so you see the different segments that were here uh, and you will look, and I didn't, uh, and, I, and I can certainly work with Cliff to get this information, but majority of these roads in the 10 year life of the cycle of the plan, at some point these roads that are patched in this first year uh, will be touched again in the plan through some type of overlay as we go forward. So, uh, and so, uh, but this is just to take those roads that are in the fair and bump them up to the good uh, level to hold them there in place. And these are some of the more severely uh, distressed ones uh, in, in the plan. And then there's one uh, segment, as you see, uh, that we're going to do some rehab on. Um, and again, the other thing I'll, I'll observation or point I'll make here is what we what the capital plan tried to do was to look at the data today and decide what streets needed to go and what treatments needed to go today. And so then you come up with a budget of patching and rehab. So in this case, it was about uh, the $809,000 uh, um, 120 of that was a rehab, and in 680, 690 or so was patching. So what that means is the budget for that year is 690 or so of patching, and 120 or so is rehab. And so if you get out to be able to put your contract together, and you see you need to make a change, or there's another priority, you can move around as long as you kind of keep it in that ratio of 690 of patching. Uh, in, in, in something of, of, 
uh, rehab. And, and we did that. I think the Hillcrest uh, recommendation, we did modify that some. I think there was another road that when we looked at it, there was enough patching on it that by the time we got done marking patching, it made more sense to overlay it. So, so we've made some, some of those strategic adjustments in the field, those field adjustments. And I think that certainly that you'll have that flexibility to do that going forward. Yes, sir. What effect does traffic volume have on the system? And so to do develop capital plans, that's where ranking comes into play. And so working with the town, uh, we developed a three-tier. There was an A, B, and a C, I think. Um, and so and that took into account what was basically collector or connector roads. And then we looked at, um, uh, I think, the other two thresholds. Cliff, hold me on this here, was we looked at 10 uh, dwellings or more or 10 dwellings or less. And so we kind of looked at and so. Yeah, understanding that the more houses should be the more trips generated more traffic so we did try to weigh traffic in addition to the pci in uh prioritizing so that played in two 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 ways and it played into how we weighed it going through development capital plan but it also weighed in on the types of treatments uh, so on those rows that were class category a's uh, we would put heavier repair recommendations on those roads than we did on a road that was a C category. So yes. And I'm sorry, I didn't repeat his question. His question was, how did traffic factor into the, the I guess, the determination of the roads that we chose for the plan and also the treatments? I'm adding this part, the treatments for the plan. And that's, that's what we were addressing. So now the next few uh, uh, slides are of the um, of the uh, actual the plan, what we're doing. So what we tried to do, and I'm like right, Cliff, I'll try to navigate this. So we, we put dots on a map and these are the actual locations and I didn't put a table, but I certainly that information will be available. Uh, so you see the purple dots are full depth uh, patches the uh, green indicates a mill and overlay. The blue dots are mill patches. The, the kind of purple uh, is an overlay. And then the brown dots are surface patches. So everywhere you see is the number of locations on that road, there'll be a patch activity on the patching. Uh, patching. And so even on some of the roads that have getting mill and replaced, in this plan, there's also some patching that would go take place. And I think to your point earlier, if we saw there was some some structural failure, then you need to address that. You don't just pave over top of it because it'll come back through that. So that was why you see some dots on on the pave. So and and so as you go through, you'll you'll see. And obviously, um, you know, you see the roads that have some significant impacts on those and. In, in those dots. And uh, and again, uh, we're trying to hold the road together and, and, and deal with those. Yeah. This is just, a, you know, I got four different maps. I'll scroll on. We can come back to one if, if we need to. And this is and obviously a lot of challenges on dogwood. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, and and again, those are those strategic choices you make. Is that now obviously you see those number of patches on dogwood, and you well, why don't we just pay that? Well, well, you can, but if you get the link of that, then you you're probably going to wipe out your budget. You may not have enough budget. Again, those different places where we come back and touch parts segments of that to get it over. There. Yes, sir. The question. Okay, good. And the last one of these. And again, uh, and again, I think that the intent here was just really to show the locations uh, where and kind of the number of plate times that it's, it's being touched for the patch. Obviously, the other thing that we'll use this information for is quantities for the contractor. So he's not out arbitrarily picking spots to patch. We have identified 
And this doesn't mean that every spot on a road will be patched. We were trying to, what were the most significant ones that would impact the, the quality of that road and the rating of that road, trying to address those uh, uh, in the most judicious and efficient way possible and also develop quantity. So I know one of the concerns with these types of contracts is, you know, is giving the contract a direction, but, but I certainly believe clear, concise direction through the contractor. He likes that. I think it, affect, it allows him, him to be able to effectively bid and know what he's getting into. And you, you lead that and not allow, don't leave that up to his imagination. Yes, sir. Yeah, about the Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Which one is that? Okay, I see. Okay, it was. What's What's your question? I don't know if I need to follow up. No, I think I see it. It's there. In that clamshell, is that what you, clamshell trail? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's more up there. Okay. Okay. We must not. It's first year, right? First year. This is first year. First year. Yes. First year. Yeah. I'm just wondering what it looks like. I didn't put those in here. I guess we can look before yeah. I, before I leave. We can look it up. Okay. So. And so the um, the bottom line is, I think if we implement uh, as we implement this plan, then you see again the current year you see the seventy three percent of fare, and then if we implement this plan. The, this, as we uh, propose, if you look at year 2032 or the 10th year of the plan, I know we're going to slide out a year, you see we've dramatically reduced uh, the fare down into the 20, to the tone of about 20, only 25 percent. You've dramatically increased your your good and excellent, and we don't, it, uh, which is, you know, from about roughly about 27 uh, percent to uh, about se a little over 70% at the end of the plan. So, so again, uh, we feel like that this is um, uh, uh, a, a good way to touch the streets and still balance uh, the need to uh, uh, to be able to deal with those construction issues when you when they come up and those significant issues there. So what happens after 2032? In my opinion, is I think if if, if, if <laughs> obviously again. Roads have life cycle. There's a there's a life cycle to roads, yeah. so now you're moving forward with another with, you get another, another plan. plan. But most of that plan should really be uh, preservation, thin list, and those types of things because now you've got a handle on it uh, at that point. So, so, I want to say, so for this ten-year plan it covers all 36, 36 miles of roads. I don't think we get them all. Or More than that by 2032. I mean, it just counts. So, uh, but that covers every single road, just about. Just hardly any major rebuilds. Not very many. There wasn't very many. I'm talking about just all the way out. Yeah. The, 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 the question was did the plan uh, touch all the roads? Uh, and I think the answer to that is, it, I think the vast majority. And then I think the follow-up to that was it touches all the roads without uh, many major rebuilds uh, uh, as, as well. And so, and I, I think the answer to that is. It's, it's the only reason I asked that is when I, when I saw this um, street I live on, wasn't, nothing's going to be done for 10 years. So okay. what's street is that? Okay. Yeah. okay. Nothing's done for 10 years. So okay. the size of the road is practically not going to be done. It's like the road, yeah, it's, it's, it's falling okay. away. But I mean, it's. It's all the bicycles are on it, so really they did it. They went down to the base several years ago and mm -hmm. had to fix that because okay. it was a mess. But did the same thing with Juniper. Juniper is, uh, that was my question. There's more traffic on the feeder roads, as you call them, mm -hmm. than 
The juniper, wasn't that one that's been approved? Is in approved, yeah, approved. Juniper trinity, yeah. yeah. So, the, my, yeah, my, I, yeah, so those roads like dogwood, you saw those patches there. Yeah. So, when we do repay that, that's probably going to be a major rehab that's going to be a mill and in, in in, with buildup. So we'll we'll increase the pavement structure to that when it's touched, and and I think I know I've seen that in the plan. It's in I had to memorize all ten years of the plan, but I think it's it's in the plan uh, to be built up. Is, is there any other town or any other uh, location in the state where this kind of maintenance plan has been put into place? Yeah, uh, we just be working with the town of Elizabethtown, which is down in the southeast, and they're currently doing. Are very similar and obviously their town and community is a little different so uh, they're putting in some different treatments they're using a, a ast uh, which is basically rock and tar to do some of their preservation activities uh, on their roads but i think everything else is exactly the same they're paving they're crack sealing they're milling uh, particularly in the curb and gutter sections they have they're milling and filling uh, so it's, it's, it's practically it's the, it's the same approach uh, I'm guessing that this, this direction has been approved, is that right? The, the first year, the first year is here, uh, is long-term would save the town money. Yes. I mean, that's what I'm getting over the 39-year plan. Yes. <laughs> Whatever it was. So, I mean, that's, that's good. I mean, that's, um, yeah, I'm going to, if I, I don't get to. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. I, I want to show um, the question about, Okay, you know, folks are going to want to know um, what is scheduled on their street and when. One thing that we will put this out on the website as soon as it's done, it's, it's a GIS map that um, folks will be able to go onto their street. They'll be able to go onto this map and um, click their, let's see if I got this. I think this is it. So you asked about POTUS key. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it was rated excellent, which it should be. Let's see if I can. The, the long-term plan to address. Well, okay, here's clamshell. We talked about. Um, so if you click on that street, you'll see it. it this is anybody will be able to do this when we get this website live. You, um, Oh shoot! Can I do that? Does the pavement in these years, the first few years, control the budget, or is there anything in the budget that would address other than pavement issues with roads, i.e., yeah. bridges? Okay, so uh, the question was about about budgeting, and, and I'm, I want to get back to one thing you had mentioned about um, when we bid these projects, they're going to be on a per unit cost. So if, if we're out there doing the work and we're out there doing uh, field corrections and we see, like you mentioned, we, we've got a shoulder that's failing, we can go to that per unit cost, we can get whatever stone or the material we need and we can address it and fix it then. And when they start doing the the projects, the milling and, and digging up, and we see we got, um, we can't just put lipstick on a pig, so to say, we got to get a new pig, then we can go to that per unit cost and, and build that. This, and that's what the 200,000 construction is for. So the 800,000 is for the pavement, 200,000 is for construction. To answer your question about um, other projects, the stormwater and uh, the, the culvert on Trinity, those types of projects would be budgeted separate. Yes. Um, okay. Who does this work? The city? No, the, we'll. Is it a contract to have to qualify? It is. It'll be, con when we go, hopefully, we'll be presenting the council the uh, bids, the contracts for this in April, and, and we want to, Kind of get the blessing of the council that historically there's only been two 
in most of our projects, there's only two contractors that can bid. P part of that issue is you got to get the asphalt and there's, they can't bring it far away. And so as part of this process of educating, we're going to meet with those contractors and kind of tell them what our plan is and what we're trying to do. I, I wish I could show you this, this website because, and, and eventually, you know, it'll be live, but it, it's pretty simple to navigate. You can go onto this website, you can find your street, you can click on the street, you can see what your PCI index is, you can see pictures of the distresses that Anthony mentioned, and then you can see in each year or or when constructions or pro, uh, construction projects, paving, paving is scheduled by year. Um, so I, I think that'll be a benefit to folks. So. Um, there's work on that section of clamshell in 23, 24, and 30. 23 would be um, patching. Uh, 24, let's see if I can. Um, 24 would be more patching. And then in 30, looks like an overlay. And um, let's see, there was the, the other things that you mentioned about widening the road and, and that sort of thing. Those, those two, I think, would be construction time decisions that the council is going to have to make policy decisions on. You'd asked about the traffic. And it, it, the way Anthony explained this to me, they're looking down. They're looking at the pavement. They're, you know, they're not looking at width. They're not looking at much more than the condition of that pavement. But they did rank these PCIs by A, B, and C, A being a South Dogwood, um, uh, maybe a B being a Podeskite, and C being Happy Indian Trail. And that's not to say I'm prioritizing those streets in that way. That's just ranked on the volume of traffic. I'm gonna step back. So when you, so when you, when you, I'm just asking questions here. You say out of line, just. Uh, I'm sorry. So the circle, I call them circle, but it's the little streets off the main street, you know, like the curb pond is across from the other mass. Okay. I think it's mass because the trash truck doesn't have You know, we, we have two, you have uh, eight tires turn at a short radius, they're going to rip up the uh, uh, asphalt. I mean, it, uh, and I know it's on there, it's there to be fixed. It's on myself, and it's actually 21 or 22. So, but is, do you use less material to fix that, or is that road the same as it is for South Carolina or for uh, Trinity? That I'm you know what I'm saying, the thickness? I mean, do you, you know, kind of like an apron in an airport. You, know, you don't need, you don't need, in the apron, you don't need as much weight as you do on the runway, you know, and all that weight's coming down. Yeah, the, the, uh, the question was about the um, kind of the cul-de-sacs or the, yeah, the essentially the roundabout streets. Um, and those those do deteriorate faster because of the turning radius yeah. of, uh, yeah. Uh, Anthony can, I'll let him speak to how the, they, their plan maintains that. But in the, in the past, uh, I believe it was wood duck, that was kind of a, a project that was identified based on the things that you're mentioning that needed to be addressed. And so that was a construction project that, that kind of took care of that cul-de-sac. Right. And there's been other cul-de-sacs, landfall loop. Um, yeah, and- They're turning around the ends and they the gas. So they did all the construction on one end, the other end. Those projects are kind of Set, not separate, but they're, they need to be addressed and they need to be addressed differently because it's a different yeah, problem. That's kind of the impact of the talk on our way through. But uh, I think you're right. I think um, uh, certainly those cul de sacs, those turning areas, we would need to look at beefing uh, that up or. If the turning radius is not big enough, if there's room, where there's room, you would 
you'd want to try to widen that out and beef it up, but uh, and then go from there. And I think, in looking at it, it looked like we were just going to try to repair it with some heavy patching initially. But when it comes up for paving, uh, I think that does look consideration that have to be taken into account in the, in the field. And so as far as I think the last slide, so if you don't want to, is that we're going to do is kind of what's the next steps where we go from here. Uh, we, we, we've actually got a draft a contract that we, uh, Cliff and I have some conversations about tonight, but we'll go into the bidding phase at this point. And that's, we got to advertise the project. We will have a pre-bid, you know, Cliff mentioned about talking to the contractors. I think it's important that we get them in and make sure that they understand uh, what's expected. I mean, this is work that they do, so it's not new stuff. It may be some things they hadn't necessarily done in Southern Shores before, so we need to kind of talk to them. And our, our expectation is when we kind of lay out the vision for where we're going over the next 10 years, then they can kind of plan for here's what we need to be looking to the work that we can expect in Southern Shores over the next uh, 10 years. And we think that will help them plan. We think that it has a, a positive effect on pricing. I mean, to the, the things they can control. I mean, they can't control, I guess, what crude over cost and all those things. But I think if they can see that plan where you're going, then I think it helps them get ready for that. And then also make sure they got the tools and equipment to do that. We'll have a bid opening and then we'll have a bid review and award recommendations with the goal of having the contract awarded in April by the council and then the contractor uh, may be able to contract at that point. And there's some things that we're going to do from a specification standpoint. One of the things I know, uh, again, for me, same, I live in a, in a community as well, and I don't like to get impacted no more than I have to. I want to minimize that. So through specifications and other things, we can can dictate when you start. You, st you don't start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. That you come in and you get out. The other thing is to try to address some of the loading where we're milling and filling. You don't mill it off and then leave it exposed for days. If you mill, you mill. You have to put it back the same day. Again, doing everything we can to try to minimize getting into those uh, uh, sur surfaces. So, who inspects the work that's done and signs off by the Cowboys? Either every time you see a project, like the blue one across the river, you know, the state trucks are all over the place. Okay. I don't think we have state trucks. Well, I'll, I'll, I don't, <laughs> so who's, and again, who's watching these guys? I'll, I'll, who's watching to make sure they do. I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. I do, I do think a certified, qualified uh, inspector is important to the finished product. Some of the work, I think, and Cliff and I have had some dialogue about this. Some of his team can, I think, look after some of the work, uh, but then uh, we'll talk about uh, you know, how that's done. But I think your point's well taken that it does need to be a qualified, certified um, in oversight of that work. Yeah. I know the state guys. I don't know if anybody's qualified to do that, but that's not their job. In the first year, y'all are going to know if we're going to marry them. We're going to answer my question. That's my next one. Where do you guys fall in? Well, he, he, he's my boss, so he, he tells. <laughs> Absolutely. As far as the kind of the QA and uh, QC in the field, in this first year, we've, because this is a transition from what the town's traditionally done, we're going to work with CEPI in this first year to get this plan. We'll kind of be under their wing. Um, and, but after that, then, you know, it, the town can do this. We've got town engineer, we've got a public works director who used to do this type of inspection for DOT. So, so I feel pretty comfortable that, that between the two of them, they'll be able to make sure the quantities are, you know, we're, we're paying for what we, we, we got and that it's done according to specifications. Any other questions? Anybody on line? Are they still there? All right. Well, no questions here. Thanks. All right. Then thank you all again. We'll have this website that I mentioned up and live soon. Um, and thank you.